Thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, I initially, and what's, what's in the program book, and I'll apologize for this right now, is that I was going to be very sarcastic and present how to build a system that excludes people. And as I was putting things together, I just couldn't do that. Uh, having, I, I couldn't do that to me, I couldn't do it to other people. So this is going to be how to build a system that doesn't exclude people. Uh, that said, if you still really want to know how to exclude people, you can probably figure it out pretty easily from the slides. Uh, who I am? Uh, I've been a Perl developer since 95. Uh, the first program I wrote was 1982. Uh, it displayed my name. Uh, that was very important to a five-year-old girl. Uh, the first Unix I used was AUX. Uh, just show your hands if you know what AUX is, what platform it ran on. Well, that's a lot better than I thought. Wow. Uh, first Linux I used was Slackware 1.1. Uh, raise your hand if you use something older. OK, so there's, there's a few people. Uh, first CPAN module I, I put on the CPAN was Acme Unicodify. And it takes Latin text, uh, some not terribly look-alike, look-alike characters, and it, it converts between the two. So you can test your application. Does it pass through Unicode UTF properly? Uh, not terribly useful. Uh, the next module I did was a lot more useful, which is Parallel Work Unit, uh, which is a, a multi-paradigm concurrency uh, kind of toolkit using Fork and Perl 5. Uh, it says here, I have a lot of opinions. I do. They're mine and not my employer. So uh, don't blame them. Don't call them up and tell them you're canceling your service. It's, it's, it's not their fault. They, it's not their fault. So go and start by talking about why discriminatory design happens and what I mean by it. And the, the, the start of it, it kind of, it's, it's hard to design for the 100%. It's hard to design for the whole world on anything. And this is true in computers as much as anything else. And I give an example that's very US centric here. Uh, but you can obviously apply it to whatever uh, area of the world you're in. Uh, U.S. residents are 4% 4, 4 of the world's population, according to the U.N. Um, and then within the U.S., and we see this a lot of times with designs, because people say, OK, all, all I need to do is support English. OK, well, that's 92% of the U.S. population now, uh, because 8% of the U.S. population, if you ask them, say, do you have good uh, English skills, they'll say no. Uh, then, of course, you're going bill by credit card, right? 25% of American adults don't have any credit cards. So, well, maybe, maybe you don't want their money. So now you're 75%. And then you say, then you say, and it, my application is going to require you to be online. Well, 30% of Americans have no internet at home. Uh, and this is a developed country, uh, but you add up all that and you get about half of Americans might be excluded by just very, very, very typical design choices. And now you apply that to, you started by starting with Americans. You're missing a lot of market. You're missing a lot of chance to make some revenue. Uh, if you multiply everything out, it ends up being 2.1% of the world uh, that your, your application is reaching. Of course, this is an argument that people will make a lot of times when they're building an application, when they're uh, starting a new company. We only do business in the US. so. Why do we, or, or in this case, the EU, why do we, we don't need to worry about the rest of that. Of course, by that we mean, let's say, the European single market. There's multiple definitions of EU and Europe, uh, what people might mean. But let's say you said, oh, the European single market. And I apologize if I get any of this wrong, because I am not uh, European. So, uh, But I notice something strange here. Because uh, I've done business with the European single market. Forgot about these people, for instance. Uh, this is Reunion. Uh, they're French. Uh, you can see where, where they're located. Uh, east of, I would say just east of Madagascar, but that's actually quite some distance. These are uh, European overseas countries and territories. Uh, some of which participate in the single market, some don't. Uh, and outermost regions, they do participate in the, in the single market. 
also say, oh, I want to reach Europeans. Well, what about these people? Uh, on the left there, that's the uh, French embassy in the United States in Washington, D.C. Uh, the one on the right, does anyone know where that is? It's Antarctica. It's the Polish research station in Antarctica. Uh, arguably, both of them are going to have Europeans. Of course, it's, that's one area that, that we might see some discrimination on. Uh, but it's not just geography that you have to think about when you're building your applications. Uh, I could say they tried. Uh, and they, they, they obviously went through some effort to do this. Uh, and they did put grip strips on it, which, which probably helped. Uh, you're <laughs> missed the bottom, and, and I'm pretty sure you'd have to be pretty dang tough to make it up that ramp, even if it had a bottom. Uh, when you're designing online apps or phone apps or desktop apps uh, for people, uh, you have to consider all levels of abilities. Uh, all, let me not say levels of abilities, all, all abilities. Uh, for instance, you don't want to require a lot of mouse-based movement as your only option to access the application. Uh, keyboard, uh, keyboard alternatives are good. Uh, but when you're thinking about this, you've got to think there's not one group of physically disabled people that are uni uniform and uh, all have the same concerns. Uh, I'll give just two examples of people that might have trouble with typical uh, mouse-based navigation. Uh, one group has trouble uh, doing fine motor control. Uh, and maybe they're using a pointer stick, maybe they're using eye gaze, uh, but selecting that really tiny uh, little... Uh, GUI widget's going to be very tough, uh, very frustrating. Uh, they'll go to your competitor. Uh, the other uh, disability uh, that may re uh, come up is someone that has trouble uh, with big movements. Uh, so they might be able to move things small, uh, but if they're, they're required to move the mouse a good distance a lot, they're going to be worn out uh, using your application. Uh, and I kind of hinted this with the bottom bullet. Uh, that, that means you, one interface isn't going to cut it probably. You're probably going to have to figure out how do I meet these different needs that may not be compatible in one in the same interface. There's some really interesting research going on on how to do this programmatically. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Uh, but in the meantime, we just have to think about how our applications are being used. So some things you might do to keep in mind those two very different things is you might minimize scrolling. A uh, lot, of, lot of people have, have trouble with that. The people that can do fine mo motor movement, that's probably OK. But the people that, uh, if they have to go and hit a scroll bar and then go all the way back up to the top of the form, maybe not. Um, touch and mouse target should be large. Uh, most people know that. Uh, but that's obviously really important. Eliminate timeouts on forms. Uh, these days, there's not a lot of reason for your web application to time out a form unless there's actually something on the back end that's time dependent. Uh, very frustrating to spend the time filling out a very long form. And I know we've all experienced it. Hit submit and, sorry, timed out. You took too long to get your information. Well, imagine if that form took you 10 times or 20 times as long to fill out in the first place. You're going to be extremely frustrated. Uh, make back button work, please. Uh, I probably don't need to say a lot, lot there. Uh, basically, don't make your application a physical ability test. This is an example with, with the physical ability. Uh, go find your date uh, because that's way easier on a desktop than hitting four numbers, uh, or at least Facebook thought so. The good news is, to their credit, and, and I'm, I apologize if anyone works for Facebook, I tried to pick people that weren't sponsors or anything of the conference. <laughs> uh, you can actually type in your, your year. So they do have at least a keyboard option, although you'd have to know that was there. I imagine someone that has trouble scrolling would probably try that. Uh, but uh, it could be a little more discoverable. You only, you only get focus when you use the top key. 
Yeah. Uh, another area to think about when you're designing your application, these are all, I'm just trying to present areas where you need to consider things you may not have considered, uh, is ages. Uh, one of the really common things is to assume, okay, I want my application for adults uh, because they can enter into contracts. So age of majority is, is what we call that in the U.S. It's called that some other places, different things elsewhere. Well, it's not always 18. Don't, don't necessarily assume it's 18. Uh, age of majority in Saudi Arabia is 15. Uh, age of majority in uh, Kuwait, Singapore, Mississippi in the U.S., uh, and this differs from most of the U.S., is 21. Uh, so it can vary. Uh, that 18-year-old might not be able to enter a contract if that's really what you're going for. Uh, that 15-year-old very well may be able to enter a contract. 101-year-old uh, people use computers. Uh, that's the four-digit uh, version of the Y2K bug is, well, we'll give you 100 years for your birth date. Um, I, I think most people are aware that different age groups use technology differently, uh, not less aptly, but differently. Uh, an example may be uh, younger people may prefer certain kinds of devices, older people may prefer different kinds of devices to access your site. Uh, so if you focus on, say, just mobile, you may be excluding people on the basis of age. 25-year-old uh, developers uh, can read fonts that 50-year-old developers or 50-year-old anyone can't. Uh, that's not universal, obviously, but my point here is uh, make sure that people, if, if you've got a young team, make sure you run your site by at least a few people that are, that, that are a little older to make sure we can, we can read the site. Um, now I give security questions should not assume youth. This is a really common one. Uh, what I mean here is you have a question like, uh, where did you meet your spouse? Um, if you've only had one spouse, that, that question's probably pretty easy to answer. But 20 years from now, if for whatever reason you've had another spouse, you have to remember when you signed up for that site, which <laughs> spouse it was talking about. Uh, don't, don't do that. And then, Talking about the 100-year-old rule, no one old, that old uses my site. I'm, I'm okay with that. So this is the AARP's website. That's the American <laughs> Association of Retired People. But the good thing is they don't discriminate in the other direction. Another idea or another area where uh, it's very easy for us who are very familiar with technology to, to be discriminatory is with computer knowledge. And I'm going to use example of some of the items you might see on the, the screen because, I mean, we know GUIs are more friendly. Everyone told us that. Uh, so you get this little symbol, which is an inverted L with a arrow kind of thing. Uh, I know what that is. Probably most of the people in the room would recognize it in this context. Uh, as I get additional details I can provide on this type of thing. Uh, however, if, if I pulled that out of context and just showed it to people, I'll bet you people would have a hard time with that, uh, except whoever the graphic designer that came up with that was. Uh, you, I, I asked people online, I said, what, what kind of areas have you had trouble with learning applications? Someone said, uh, what does dot, dot, dot mean? I'll see, a fee, I'll see a, some text and then a little button with three dots on it. Well, we know that, that, that gets you more information about that. That drills down somehow. Same with uh, plus and minus. You might see a plus or a minus button next to something, say, in a chart or a table. And we know that can expand and, and contract things. But that's not universal knowledge. Uh, so be careful when you add features like that, that there's ways to discover uh, what they mean, and the way to discover is, is easy. It's not just try every option. And then, for example, of what I mean by the icons, and just because it's a picture doesn't make it easy, I, uh, I'll challenge anyone at break to tell me what every single one of these 
icons would mean in an application. That's uh, Mexican currency, uh, pesos. Uh, financial side of things, you want to take their money uh, if you're in a business. That's usually what, what the name of the game is. Uh, but we can make a lot of assumptions here. We can assume that people, everyone has a credit card. Uh, they don't. Not everyone wants a credit card or can qualify for a credit card. Uh, not everyone has a cell phone. Uh, so if you're going to rely on billing based on cell phone accounts, not everyone has one. Uh, make sure that that's a conscious decision that you're excluding those people. Make sure you know how many people you're excluding and who you're excluding. Uh, not everyone has a bank account. Uh, some people rely on cash. Uh, and again, not everyone has a home address. So when you require a home address to bill them, maybe, maybe that's excluding someone. Maybe you don't want to do that. Uh, I run into this one all the time in the UK is the chip and pin because US doesn't do pin. We just do chip. Um, and don't, don't ask me why. I don't work for a bank. Uh, but for whatever reason, we just do the chip. I can guarantee I can lock up any Tesco self-checkout machine uh, by just using my credit card because it'll prop up and say I need to sign something and there's no place to sign. Uh, I'll raise my hand, get the store clerk over there. He'll look at the machine, say, I've never seen this before. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, after five minutes of fiddling with the machine, uh, he'll, he'll say, well, can you use the regular checkout stand? Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's an example of a design where someone probably didn't test it uh, with an American card. Uh, and then this is more of an issue in the U.S. Uh, postal codes have more than one format. I mean, everyone assumes that everyone else's postal code looks like their postal code. And in the U.S., what that means is when you fill up with gas, you put your credit card in. Uh, because we don't have PIN, it validates your postal code. Uh, so it'll ask for your postal code. Well, what gives you a little numeric keypad? A uh, lot of people have more than numbers in their postal code. This is a case study on the financial side, was Amtrak, which is the U.S.'s national railroad, or what, what we have that passes for a national railroad. Uh, they probably looked at their data and said, everyone that's buying tickets, it's 98% online. Let's, let's, get rid, let's save some money. Let's get rid of these ticket agents. Uh, Everyone has a credit card. We can just do it online. Well, then the West Virginia, and I'll touch on why in, in a few screens, the West Virginia congressional delegation, because um, this is uh, somewhat nationalized, uh, said, wait a minute. You're excluding a lot of our people that are buying tickets with cash in person. Um, the short of it is they, they hired their ticket agents back. Um, probably didn't save any money in this process. talked about physical disabilities. There's also sensory disabilities. Uh, be careful with, with what you're requiring for vision. Uh, at the very least, run through your site with a screen reader. Just try it. See if you can do it. Uh, you know your site, so you should be able to navigate it with a screen reader. If you can't, someone else probably doesn't have a lot of chance either. Uh, but beyond that, uh, try to use good contrast, try to avoid small fonts, and I say this on a slide with somewhat small fonts. Uh, use uh, alt tags, uh, those kind of accessibility things. And there's all kinds of resources on this online. Uh, as far as uh, audio, um, when, you, when you got a voice, uh, video, uh, provide captions. Uh, that's good not just for uh, people that can't hear. Uh, it helps people that have processing disorders. Uh, I have trouble uh, doing auditory processing. I can hear fine, uh, but picking out words can be difficult. Uh, it helps people that uh, are in a noisy environment. It helps people that are at work uh, that don't want to play their, play their sound. Uh, and then avoid using color as a sole way of communicating information. I give an example here of the Trivial Pursuit game, uh, which is awful for some people with certain kinds of color blindness because color is so much a part of that game. Don't do that. This is a slide and I had to obfuscate a lot of the data, uh, unfortunately, but the data doesn't matter. Uh, I'm illustrating 
how color can be both, how you can do it both wrong and right at the same time. Uh, the wrong, obviously, I don't know which, which one is that and which one's that. Uh, but the good is I'm demonstrating I, how this came up is I clicked on that little legend label. And I can pick the color dynamically, and it'll change in real time, and the system even will remember my choices. Uh, so that's a pretty darn cool feature. Uh, the one downside I'd say with this design is they don't tell you you can do that. Uh, so it's secret knowledge around my organization on how to do that uh, so you can make the color right. Everyone should be doing that in graphs. That's just awesome. Uh, I know there's a lot of times where I've been trying to plot maybe data of my company versus a competitor. My company, of course, has corporate colors. The co that competitor, of course, has corporate colors. Be nice to not have the color switched on the graph. Uh, so it's nice to be able to select it, and the computer's not going to know what the corporate colors are. Another area where people frequently uh, have trouble is addresses. Uh, you cannot map people into 2D space. It just does not work. Uh, Google uh, did a press release a while ago on how they came up with a system to find a two-dimensional coordinate anywhere on Earth. And it was a neat idea. Uh, I kind of wonder if anyone in Google might have lived in a flat or not. Uh, because they were thinking any point on the surface of the Earth. They weren't thinking, well, my address when I'm four floors up is different than the address of someone eight floors up. Um, addresses don't all have the same parts. Uh, not every address is going to have a street. Uh, in the US, we often have forms ask for your street address. Not everyone has a street. Uh, if you have a street, you may or may not have a number. Uh, so don't make assumptions about addresses unless you're absolutely sure they're valid. Uh, don't assume end lines are sufficient for your address. Uh, someone will have a longer address. Uh, this comes up a lot with uh, corporate uh, mailings, where you might have to specify a building, a floor, a mail stop, uh, whatever else inside that, that building, but it comes up in plenty of other places too. Uh, names change, addresses change. Just because your street name changed, or, or your, the building name changed, doesn't mean you want to re-authenticate that user necessarily. You need to recognize that there can be changes for all kinds of reasons other than someone moving. Uh, an example of this, uh, sometimes you regret naming things, uh, is my local uh, metro area. Uh, one of the county sheriffs uh, was very popular, and they named the county jail after him. Um, problem was, a few years after he was out of office, he was caught uh, dealing drugs. Uh, <laughs> He was thrown into his jail, uh, and they had this big emergency governmental meeting to strip the name off the jail. Uh, so, so be careful. I mean, we, we know we've, we've seen with colleges in the U.S. where they named a dormitory off after someone that was a proponent of slavery, uh, and obviously that's not cool, and that, that name needs to change. Um, names change. I also uh, have run into new construction being an issue. I've run into this personally when I wanted a phone service at a relatively new apartment building I moved into. I call up the, the phone company. Uh, I say, hey, I'm in building uh, 32 at this complex, blah, blah, blah. And the person on the other end of the phone, I hear this pause, and then he says, are you sure you don't live in building 37? Because I have that in the computer. And well, I was sure I wasn't in building 37. And, most people would probably be able to figure out that if there's a 37, there might be a 32. Uh, but regardless, I had trouble with that. I got past that, and then I ran into the next thing. I mean, that took several layers of escalation to get an address entered into their system. Uh, where I lived had the same postcode as the neighboring town. Um, that's not uncommon in the world for a postcode to span towns. Uh, so they put the order in with my postcode, with my town name, but somewhere in the system, it assumed the town name matched the postcode, and the post office was in the neighboring town. So sure enough, send the tech out. The tech closes the ticket, says, that, that address doesn't exist in this town. Uh, it moves on. Uh, I did eventually solve the problem. Uh, I got a cell phone from their competitor. <laughs> 
So uh, part of this too is allow overrides of address verification. If you have an automatic address verification system, it's never going to be up to date enough. Uh, so allow ways to override that that are straightforward. And then people move. This is from eBay. And you go out to their addresses, they got five different addresses for you to update. So if you update your registration address, you, or, you bid on something, you get it, it's going to get shipped to your old address unless you also updated your shipping address. Um, so there's, there's, and there's another address that's not mentioned on here, and that's your credit card address. Uh, so if you have something like this, this is fine. These are all legitimate that you might have need for different addresses. Uh, if someone changes one of them, though, you might want to prompt and say, hey, are you trying to change all of them? Uh, do you know these other ones exist? Uh, do people know who this woman is? Uh, Hetty Lamar. Uh, you know what she did? What's relevant for this conference? Uh, she, she invented uh, spread spectrum uh, radio communication, time-based to be specific, spread spectrum radio communication. Uh, it wasn't recognized as important as it has become uh, at her time. Unfortunately, she didn't get any money for that, uh, which is really unfortunate. Uh, I hear she was also in some movies. Uh, I, I have her up there because talking about knowledge that people may or may not have. She obviously has a lot of knowledge. Uh, tell people where they, ha where they can find the information you're asking them to enter on, on forms. Uh, Part of that's defining your acronyms. Part of it's avoiding the industry terms. I mean, I, I saw these all on different sites. Enter ABA routing number. Uh, well, in the US, that's a number on your check. Most people in the US won't know that. Uh, that's the American Banking Association. Uh, you, have, you really need to show them a picture of the check and what information you want off of that check. Uh, API, we use this a lot. The first time you use a term, even something like that in your documentation, define it. Uh, and Avatar, there's a couple prominent CPAN, com or, or not CPAN, uh, well one of them happens to be, uh, community sites in the Perl community that talk about your avatar. Uh, that's great for people that know what that word means uh, in that context. It's not so great for someone that maybe doesn't, maybe isn't a first speaker of English. Uh, make it easy, file bugs, that's kind of one of my pet peeves, is when I have a problem with your application, I've lost a lot of work. I go out, fill out your bug tracker, and you want me to fill in 40 different pieces of information that I don't know just to tell you that your application broke. Uh, that's not useful. I'm not going to tell you that. You're going to go to your meetings, your stand-ups, and say, yeah, we don't have any bugs. Uh, and part of that's not excluding newcomers. Uh, think about how someone new to your community or new to your application, what that experience would be like. Uh, for that person. And I'll give a couple examples of that knowledge. This is an actual example from some place I used to work. Uh, the context was a host name request form. Uh, so someone in a, in a departmental IT role might stand up a new server, might want a host name assigned for it in the DNS uh, so that it's easy to reach the server. Uh, there is a form for that. Uh, however, some of the IT people had trouble with that that form, didn't understand what they were asking for, they weren't network people. And so the management uh, went to that person and said, hey, can you provide some guidance on this form? So this is what he provided. If you don't know how to fill out this form, please consult DNS Fine by Alvitz and uh, uh, Fifth Edition, February 2009. Uh, not useful, he, he did, to his credit, he did provide a link to the online, or the organization's library so you could request it and have that book mailed to you. Uh, so if no one else was filling out that form that month, you could get that book, read the 500 pages, and probably still not know how to answer the dang form. Uh, don't do this. Uh, that's, that's not helpful. Uh, bad example number two is bug tracker. And bug trackers are full of things not to do as far as requiring knowledge. You want your users to report bugs. You need to know that you have a problem. Uh, and there's all kinds of ways you can do this. Like, uh, you start by just calling it a ticket. We all know what that means. Uh, someone that's not in technology may not. Uh, 
make the user select from a confusing list of categories. A lot of times that'll be some big system bug. And I want to know exactly which edition of the product you're reporting this bug in. And granted, that's probably important for me to know uh, if I'm going to fix the bug. But does the user actually know that information? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, don't require users to have an understanding of how your application is built. Uh, I've seen other applications which ask which module, which Perl module, which library is this bug in? And this is for an end user application. Well, how's an end user going to know which library it's in? Uh, but I'll see people do those th things, and then on their, on their site they'll say, oh, we want new users. One way you can contribute is filling out bug reports. That way we can yell at you and you can get a system yelling at you when you can't figure out what selection to make. Uh, so, so don't do that. Uh, one of my pet peeves is asking the severity on a bug report when there's no intention of actually listening to that severity. Uh, and plus it'll usually be like one through eight. And yeah, I don't know what one is. I don't know what eight is. Uh, I know you're going to ignore the severity anyhow because it's going to be what your product manager thinks is important this month. Uh, so why are you asking me? But if you do ask me, at least tell me what the freaking levels mean. Uh, Gender is another area where we can be uh, accidentally discriminatory. Uh, kind of this, I'll start at the second point. It's not fixed. It's not binary. It's not immutable. Uh, don't make those assumptions. And I'm glad to talk to you later about why that is, but trust me, it is. Uh, with that in mind, easiest way to deal with gender is don't collect it. Uh, most systems, you don't need to know someone's gender. It's not relevant to the system. You're actually after something else usually. You're usually after, uh, what should I call this person that is respectful? Uh, that's what you should ask them. Uh, don't infer that from gender. Uh, one of my pet peeves uh, is allowing people not, not allowing people to correct or change their gender in a system uh, without calling support, or worse, having to mail stuff to support and prove it, and who, who wants to prove who they are? Uh, and then designs, this is a subtle one, but designs that are preferred by men. If you ask people what a professional design looks like, it just so happens that the same design language that men prefer is the same design language that people think is professional. Um, that's a bias. Be careful of that one. I give an example on how to do it right. This is Meetup. This is my profile page. Every single thing on here is editable online. I can edit it. It takes the change. That's a site I want to use. <laughs> the examples of stuff that's not uh, every single hotel loyalty program in existence. Uh, I, I dare you sign up for a hotel loyalty program. Just go out there and pick one, sign up, put, put a different gender than you are, and then try changing it. Uh, if you're going to ask for gender, careful how you ask for it. This is my local health department. Uh, one of these is not like the others. Uh, the, what they're trying to do in the survey is they're trying to answer, get some public health information that's important. They're trying to figure out, is there certain groups of people that we should target as a government for substance abuse uh, programs? And so they want to know, they actually do want to know, is there in the uh, trans community, is there uh, differences with substance abuse? Uh, this is not going to get the answer. Because uh, someone that's, say, a trans woman is going to look at this and say, do I check female? Do I check transgender? Do I check I don't identify as either of these because I don't? Uh, what do you do? Uh, and it's not the information they want. They, they wanted two questions here at the very least. Another example, Facebook. They talk about their 70-whatever gender options. That's their front page, though. So what does this person do? This is a uh, person's Pakistani passport. Uh, probably can't see very well, but that's the sex field. It's an X. 
uh, and X is not referring to chromosomes or anything like that. Uh, what's this person put? This is their legal sex. The government of Pakistan says it's their legal sex. Uh, other countries that do this, uh, some in Europe do, uh, Australia does, uh, a lot of U.S. states do. So what does this person put? Does your system allow this person to buy your product? I talk about design. I'm not going to comment here, but this is an awesome design. And kind of segueing into other stuff, don't anger your customers. Uh, and obviously we have a interesting ad that I'm sure made Mr. Clean fly off the shelves. Uh, says, this Mother's Day, get back to the job that really matters. And it shows a woman that is really, really, really happy cleaning. Uh, and then shows another site. Uh, this is an application. They advertise this as, hey, we're going to solve all the problems that trans people have dating. Uh, we're going to make a site that's friendly for trans people. And then they pr proceed to use a, a slur, a derogatory slur. And you say, have you not talked to even one trans person? There's no one that would say that's, that's going to be attractive to trans people. And then getting into numbers and dates, uh, I ran into this, this bug. Uh, and that did parse in NetNetMask. It probably parses in a lot of other applications too. Um, it shouldn't. So with numbers and dates, starting with the numbers, if you're representing 100,000, that doesn't always get written. Uh, and I wrote the slide for the US, so first one is kind of US format. Of course, there's other formats. And people say, OK, as long as I handle changing the separator, I'm done. I've got my international application. Uh, that's a common format in India. Uh, three, uh, the Three, that's just how they write numbers. That's how they've written numbers for a long, long time. Uh, that's also a valid and used number format uh, to represent 1,000. That's uh, when people say Arabic numbers, you have to ask them which Arabic numbers, because that's Eastern Arabic numbers. But you say, I don't care. Well, don't worry, Pearl does. Uh, in both these code, I give the Perl 5 and the Perl 6 version, uh, the output matches. Backslash D matches all scripts for digit characters, just like it says in, in the docs. Um, now, we'll say Perl 5 and Perl 6 have a little bit different behavior as far as interpreting them. No, no string quotes here on either one. Uh, Perl 5 gives you this. Uh, Error, it's accurate. I'm not, not sure how useful it is, but it is accurate. Perl 6 actually parses it. And it's right, actually. Um, this is from the docs on Perl 5, uh, from Perl RE page. I included the first one just because I, I found it a very charming comment, and I mean that in all sincerity. Uh, the back, that, or the slash D, slash U, slash L modifiers are not likely to be of much use to you. OK. Gotcha. Uh, the slash A modifier, on the other hand, may be useful. And what the slash A does, it says, take your character classes, treat them as if you're just dealing with basically Latin script. Uh, and you can read the doc. Note that that only works in 5.14 or newer. So if you have an older Perl module, you might want to actually specify the character class 0 through 9. Uh, and dates have the same thing. I'm not going to get too much in them, but there's a couple Perl 5 modules. I don't know the Perl 6 modules to use if they're even developed yet. If not, this is a great option. Can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, I don't know which what the Perl 6 equivalent of this is. Someone does, find me, let me know. Uh, the two modules I recommend are date, time, format, CLDR, and CLDR number. The CLDR is the Unicode common locale data registry. Uh, and that has all kinds of information about how different locales represent stuff, including dates and numbers. Now I give some examples of how this formatter can present uh, US or uh, India formatted dates. Names. Uh, first name, 
does not mean given name in every country in the world. Last name does not mean family name in every country of the world. Not every country has family names. Uh, an example here is I Iceland doesn't have a family name. Uh, it has, uh, in this case, Gunnar's daughter, and I'm sure I'm saying that wrong, uh, and I apologize, but literally Gunnar's daughter uh, would be the second name. Uh, in that case, that might not be how she wants to be referred to. Uh, so uh, make sure you, you realize that when you're making your application and you're saying, oh, I'm going to take last name and I'm going to just add a gender title in front of it. Uh, allow nicknames and not other non-legal names. If someone's your customer and they want to be called something, respect that. You will piss them off if you don't. Um, if you need a name, tell them why. And I, say, I, I should have said that on the gender, too. Uh, if people know what you're asking the information for, they'll know what to provide. So if you tell me, okay, you're buying an airline ticket and your name needs to match your airline ticket, your, your legal government ID, or the TSA won't let you on that plane. Okay, I know what to provide. If it says, we want to know what to call you at the conference. Okay, I know what you want me to provide. Uh, don't assume two names. Don't assume three just because you say, oh, I'll ask for a middle initial. Uh, middle initial is culturally dependent. Uh, that's more of a U.S. issue uh, where we're, we're big on middle initials. Don't do that. And don't use names to link databases. Um, allow apostrophes, Mr. O'Malley. Allow accent marks. He's Jose, not Joe's. Uh, that is his name. Uh, John Smith Sr. and John Smith Jr. might both use your system. Uh, they may even live at the same address, but when you send the collection notice, if they don't pay their bills, you want to get the right one. So I give some bad Perl code here. And uh, this case, first and last name from the words, don't do that. First and last name split. Don't do that. Uh, I also show you don't want to use slash W if you mean A through Z, same thing as, same as the slash D. That said, this handles Jose's name properly at least, but it wouldn't handle Mr. O'Malley's name. Make it easy for people to change their names. People get married. That's the most common reason in the West people change their name. Uh, but that's not the only reason. Uh, it's it's not even the most common one in a lot of nations. Uh, so names don't stay the same. Usernames change. And let your system change the username. Uh, if Ms. Doe was married to Mr. Doe and maybe had a bad relationship, doesn't want that name anymore, let her change her name to J. Smith in your system. Uh, if you store multiple names and addresses, again, when people change them, ask if they want to change them all. And I give an example of a name change document in the US, but there's literally a 1,000 variations of that document, uh, including no document at all, uh, which is a perfectly acceptable way of changing your name in some states. Uh, and it is legally binding on your company. Uh, there's a lot of variation. I'm sure as you go international, there's even more. This is from my corporate GitHub site, or GitLab site, excuse me. Uh, I log in. I can't see any of my repos. I look at the users. I see my old name with my old username. Well, they linked with the username back to the corporate database. That disappeared, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, as a result, it's blocked. Blocked wasn't very helpful. It, took IT four or five days to figure out what was causing this and to restore my access. Phone numbers. Uh, allow out of country phone numbers. And I give US examples here, but allow uh, phone numbers. And the other thing, if you have multiple ways in your area of service that you the foreign phone numbers can be formatted, <coughs> Perl, I hear, can really do some text processing. So do it for the user. Uh, and then, again, not everyone has cell phone coverage, and certainly not everyone has cell phone coverage all the time. This is Apple. Um, I was trying to buy something from the Apple here. I said, I need to pick it up here because I don't want to ship back home. I uh, said, oh, perfect, Glasgow. They have uh, what I want. Put my mobile number in there. Can't do it.
can't not put a mobile number in there. Can't put an email as an alternative. Uh, there's just no way to do that short of finding someone that has a UK phone number to stick in there. This is uh, the state of Wyoming. It's uh, roughly uh, 100,000 square miles, uh, 250,000 square kilometers, so it's quite a big place. It's one of the US states. Uh, and you can't really see on the color, and I apologize, it's not my chart, but there is, there is about two thirds of this graph has various colors on it. One third of it, though, does not have any color. And what this map is, is it's which local phone company provides service as the incumbent in that area. In one third of this, this area, there is no local phone company. There, just, there is no local phone company. So you say, okay, that's landline. Get a cell phone. Uh, this is the cell phone coverage of the best carrier in the state. Uh, there are no di there's no carriers filling in these gaps. Um, that's a lot of land area uh, that has, has nothing. And we all know that just because the carrier shades where you are doesn't necessarily mean you have coverage. Uh, this is another US example, but I'm sure similar things exist elsewhere. This is the National Radio Quiet Zone. Uh, in West Virginia, there is this square area, it's actually West Virginia and Virginia and just a teeny bit of Maryland, that you basically can't have radio transmissions, including cell phones, federal law. Uh, if you turn on your cell phone, it won't work because there's no tower because of federal law. Uh, what do those people do? Just If you live in Petersburg, West Virginia, I guess you just don't use uh, two-factor authentication the way most people build it. Other areas where people might be discriminatory is language usage. This is by technical problems, other people's to our company is not operative. The payment with targets of credit excuse the gracious annoyances. Uh, this was obviously someone that didn't speak English natively, uh, or at least well natively. <coughs> what they're saying is their credit card machine is down. Uh, but someone put that together and thought that said what they wanted it to say. Uh, so. That person is using your website, too. So be careful with language. Use simple language. Use clear language. And I give a better example, Apple again. Uh, all this says is if you're government and we're doing something that's illegal and you're a government user, you don't have to. We're, we're, not, going to hold, we're not going to try telling you you have to do the illegal thing. Uh, apparently, they felt the need to say that in 56 pages of information. Uh, language, so yeah, first lang your language might not be their first language. Idioms and complex, uh, complex figures of speech can be difficult. Uh, avoid assumptions that are cultural. And I give example here from my locale is I might say, hey, did you go Safeway? Well, people in my area of the US, not all of the US, but my area of the US know I mean, I, did you go uh, buy food at the grocery store? Um, somewhere else, maybe not, so you need to describe it. Be careful with your profanity filters. Uh, this was a Latin saying, and apparently, uh, apparently Latin is not allowed on your cake. Uh, someone ordered it online, and the automatic <coughs> profanity filter kicked off. So I've told you all these examples, and I don't expect people to do all of them, and there's a million that I didn't talk about, uh, that I don't know about, I, I can't talk about. Uh, so what I suggest is respect what people tell you. When they tell you their name or their address is something, assume that they might actually know what they're talking about. Uh, consider how universal your assumption of a universal technology is. Uh, people don't fit neatly into boxes. You might have an X on your passport. Um, allow that person to do business with you or use your application. Uh, one big problem is people will have a focus group and they'll say, well, we have a focus group. We tested this. Everything's fine. <laughs> well, yeah, but your focus group all looks like you. Uh, so be, be careful there. Uh, reach out to minority communities if you want to know. If someone was building a transgender data, dating site and asked a few transgender people, I guarantee you we'll give you respectful terms to use. Uh, and then respond to failure quickly because you're, you're going to fail, but 
the only political thing I'll say here is think before you do. Uh, we have in the US a uh, prominent Twitter user that responds very quickly, uh, but does not always think before he does. Uh, so thank Just you for your one. time. Well, we have a pr very prominent one. <laughs> thank you, and that's my contact information. I will have these slides out, but I, I don't know where yet.